Welcome along to my video log of my 24 hour charity cycle. Um, what we did was on the 20th, Friday the 20th from 8pm through to Saturday the 21st 8pm again, um, a team of four, my like good mates, it was myself, Phil Hayes, Christopher Reed, Andrew Donnelly, we were in a team of four and essentially we had to cycle for 30 minutes, then have 90 minutes rest. 30 minutes, 90 minutes rest all the way along. So we all cycled six hours in total, but as a team we cycled 24 hours. So as you can imagine, there wasn't a great amount of sleep, a lot of activity, so it poses a big challenge for a person with type 1 diabetes. And probably what made it worse is especially myself and Phil are ultra competitive and we always want to try and push each other. So we uh, we kind of did that a little bit and I'll show you in the stats later on that that was, uh, pushed us to, to the limit. The charity bike ride was organised by Elton Cricket Club and a massive um, thank you has to go out to Chris Murray, Mike Hall and all the Elton Cricket Club people who basically now have raised over £3,000 for Berry Hospice, um, a very worthwhile charity and with your help we can probably make that a bit more and I'll put details if you want to donate afterwards, It'd be very, any donations would be gratefully received. So what's to come in this vlog? So first of all, I'm going to cover what are the, um, the key things with type 1 diabetes and exercise. And then I'm going to go through my plan and how my plan played out via my Carelink analysis. And then I'm absolutely devastated in that I took loads of video footage while I was there, but my camera didn't record it properly or there's a problem with the recordings. So I've had to scratch around to get pictures and little video snippets that um, you know, missing some of the key stuff. But just to give you a bit of a flavour, we have fun as well. We did things in neon leotards, we did them in parrot suits. And um, so I'll give you a little bit of a, um, an inkling into that because it was good fun, obviously, with it being for charity. I'll also show as a collective, because it was four teams of six, how far we cycled and which was the winning team and then how the battle went with my mate Phil. And then finally, you'll get to meet one of my best mates, Jamie, who came along not for the cycling, but for the fun party afterwards. And I've got the best video clip of him doing um, probably the best rock dance you'll ever see to Jimmy Eats World. So, yeah, that's worth staying tuned for. So, hope you enjoy, and I shall wrap up at the end. So this is just a little bit about basics of exercise and diabetes. This is a really simple diagram of what diabetes is. So in this case, you can see here the carbohydrates being eaten. It doesn't matter whether it's apples, bread, sugar, all, all gets broken down by the digestive system into glucose, which goes through your small intestines and goes into your bloodstream, represented here by the yellow dots, which is glucose. And obviously what you need is the insulin to transport the glucose from here into your muscle cells. So the muscle cells have the glucose so that you can produce the activity. As we all know, type 1 diabetes, there isn't the insulin keys from the pancreas around. So we have to either inject those or infuse them via an insulin pump. So that's pretty standard. What the, where exercise comes in, I'm sure you've heard here um, the insulin works like a key to open the cell door. What exercise does, it works like WD-40 on those locks. It makes that insulin work very, very effectively. So normally what you have, when you do activity, you become more sensitive to the insulin. Therefore, more glucose is transported from your blood into your muscle cells. Therefore, the majority of the time, the risk with extra activity is going low, going hypo. So that's the majority of the time. There are some instances where activity can push your glucose level up. And that is where the activity is very, very strenuous or you're very, very stressed and your body releases adrenaline and cortisol and hormones that actually make your liver produce extra glucose. And then actually this glucose level can rise. But that usually only happens with things like weight sessions or very intense competition or sometimes happens on um, really big competition days. So that's a little bit of physiology. So usually the problem for most people with diabetes is the risk of hypo during activity and also the risk, the risk of going low in later after the activity because that insulin sensitivity, if the activity is very, very high, it's um, almost like long-lasting long WD-40, so it can last a long time. So usually most options to prevent hypos are a mixture of either extra carbs for the activity or reduce the insulin, whether it's reducing bolus insulin or basal insulin or long acting insulin, or sometimes a combination of the both. I'm just going to talk through um, the questions that I ask myself when I'm going to do activity and how I can plan for that. 
First of all, obviously you wouldn't want to do activity if your blood level was lower than 4, otherwise you're going to be tired and weak. Between 4 and 10 will be your best performance, but some people are a little bit afraid of exercising with a level between 4 and 10 because of the risk of going low. So they sometimes push their level up between 10 and 14, which is possible to do the activity, but it can actually be much harder and you not perform at your best. If you can exercise, if the glucose level is above 14, but as long as your ketone level is less than 0.6, because if your ketone level is more than 0.6, that means there's a lack of insulin in the body and the activity is going to make that ketone issue much worse and you become ill very quickly. So there's just a little guide. Okay, so the questions I ask myself is, the first and most important is, when am I bolusing for my meal and when will there be lots of insulin around prior to the activity? So is it within an hour and a half since I've eaten? Is it between an hour and a half and three hours? Or is it been more than three hours since I last did that? If you know how much you weigh, there's some easy calculations to work out how many extra grams carbs you'll need for the activity, as long as you know how long you're doing it for and how hard. So just gonna give you a bit of an example here. The question I asked is, when did you give your last bolus insulin before doing the activity? Because we've said that activity makes your insulin that you've got on board work much more effectively. So if you exercise within 90 minutes of giving a bolus, that is when you're going to be at a high risk of going hypo, definitely, unless you have considered to reduce the insulin dose before you start. And when I talk in a minute about how I manage my activity during a 24 hour cycle, you'll see where that came into play. If the activity has been more than an hour and a half, but up to three hours, so 90 to 180 minutes since you last eaten, you can't really reduce the bolus before, because if you do, your blood glucose level will be very high by the time you start there. Um, some people will say, well, why don't you just put a temporary base on? I'll give you an example for myself here. I usually bolus at meal times around about six or seven units. So I would imagine between 90 to 180 minutes, there's still probably a good three or so units of that insulin still active. My basal rate is only 0.5 units per hour. So even if I slashed that by 50% and took it down to 0.250, I'd only miss in 0.250 of a unit per hour, which is going to do nothing when I've got three units of active insulin from the bolus on board. So the only really option here for me is to have extra carbs if I'm going to exercise in here to make sure that I don't go low. If the activity is after three hours since you've last eaten, and this is my preference, I like to make sure I've eaten three hours before, so there's very little active insulin on board in me. So then I can start thinking about, well, a temporary basal will be very useful at this point, or if I do need carbs, I'm not going to need as many as if it was between 90 to 180 minutes. So the first key question I always think about is, when did I last eat and give insulin for um, that food? And then that will dictate my plan whether I, if it's within 90 minutes, reduce the bolus before. If it's between 90 to 180 minutes, have a good amount of carbs, somewhere between half a gram to one gram of carbohydrate for every kilo that you weigh. So for me, I weigh roughly about 100 kilos. So for an hour, that would be somewhere between 50 to 100 grams of carbs, which might seem a lot. But if you've got a lot of active insulin on board, that's what you're going to need. And then, but if it's my preference after 180 minutes, then I will need less carbohydrate, maybe somewhere in the region of 0.3 of a gram of carbs for every kilo that I weigh. So for me, weighing 100 kilos, that's only 30 grams per hour, which again, when I do my exercise vlog later on, will be very useful to know. Or you can put a temporary basil on as long as you put a temporary basil on an hour before and usually run it afterwards. So those are the questions that I ask for exercise and then that will help dictate what I do. And this will come into play when I show you what I did for my 24 hour cycle now and in my next vlog, how I manage the different activities. So I hope that's not bored you too much with a bit of science, but hopefully that was pretty useful. But let's get into the real stuff. Fuck it up. <laughs> Got boots on still. Got boots on though. <laughs> Yeah. 
So this is my care link to show you what happened during the 24 hour cycle. So as discussed, we was, I was cycling for half an hour every two hours. So it was a cycle of half an hour, an hour half rest, cycle again, etc. So when I discussed before about exercise, actually <clears throat> all my boluses that I had along here, which I'll discuss in a minute, were all within 90 minutes of me doing the next level of activity. So what I decided to do was instead of putting the full amount of carbs, in for what I was eating, I only put 50% of the carbs, so I was artificially reducing my insulin dose by 50% at each time that I, ate, that I ate, so that the effect of the activity and the extra sensitivity to the insulin about actually balanced each other out to try and keep my levels as steady as possible. So if you can see from the marker here, this first level here is where I started to do my level of activity, and you can see my BG was A, and you can see the CGM tray. So along the top, this grey area is at a level of 9.0 and this bottom level here is a level of 3.5 because that's where I like to try and keep my levels between. The 8.0 here is the finger prick and the line is the CGM. Along the bottom you have the basal insulin and you can see the suspend before low. The smart guard just kicked in before, before I started doing the activity. These little towers are the boluses and in here is the carb amount. So you can see I ate a lot during this 24 hours, but I'm just going to talk you through kind of what happened and how we went. So as you can see here, I started with a finger prick of eight, which is close to the CGM. And then almost as soon as I started, I had a problem with my sensor in that it wasn't picking up, which is a real pain in the ass, literally at this point. Um, and you can see there that I tried to revive it back here at 7.8, but that didn't quite work because later on it really dipped off and I got a change sensor alarm. So that's now two sensors out of the 10 that I've had that have had this change sensor alarm. So it's definitely something worth, worth keeping an eye on. But you can see I had to put a new sensor in here and restart it, which means I went quite away without the CGM on. And then it actually kicked back in and, and tracked very well after that. So again, wasn't ideal um, from a CGM point of view. Um, certainly not. And having to change all the sensor here was a bit of a pain. But just to give you a bit of an idea of how I managed it, you can see all the finger pricks are pretty much between, on the upper end, between 7.5 and 12 all the way along. And the actual plan of reducing all my bolus doses by 50% because the activity was in 90 minutes of eating worked really well in the fact of keeping my glucose levels nice and steady because I was doing a good half an hour's exercise every two hours all the way through. You can see there were a couple of suspended before those here. There's one there. Obviously, this is a false one because the sensor is going right off. But what is interesting to note is obviously it managed very well during the activity. But then we went to bed roughly around here. And then you can see as the glucose level is traveling down, the actual suspend before low has been required later on. And again, the next morning it's also been required. So when we talked before about the effect of activity lasting maybe up to 24 hours, especially when you do lots of vigorous activity, that your risk of going hypo the next day can be quite substantial. So all in all, I managed the, um, the actual cycle really well with no actual hypos and really only one higher result further on here. So that plan of reducing my insulin dose by 50% at the, the boluses works really well because all the activity is done within, within 90 minutes. And you can imagine how many carbs I've eaten in there. I reckon I comfortably ate more calories than I cycled off, definitely. But that's the, the beauty of uh, cycling for 24 hours. It was hard work, especially around this time in the morning when I was having to get up and eat and cycle. But the things you do for charity, that's, uh, that's your call to, to donate, by the way. This graphic here shows the four teams. So we have group one, group two, group three, and then the group I was in group four. Across the top here is the half an hour slots that we cycled. And then in the, each one for each person is the number of kilometers that they cycled with the green being the furthest and the red being the lowest. Over here you have the averages. So in total, how many kilometers cycled, an average how many kilometers cycled, how many miles an average cycled. So basically, if you look from a team perspective and you add all these up, you can see the team that I was in, we cycled the furthest with 764 kilometers, almost 500 miles. So it was in a winning team, which was amazing stuff. But more importantly, the big question, who won between me and Phil? Well, you can see there's me and there's Phil and he beat me by 1.7 kilometers, gutted. 
but um, obviously it was such a good laugh. But to cycle over 200 kilometres is a serious effort. And between us, if you look at it all, we almost cycled 3,000 kilometres. So basically one pound for each kilometre we have risen, uh, raised for charity, which is a great effort. And yeah, just basically really good fun and go for charity. So again, it's your cue to donate at that point. Thank you all. <laughs> so that is a wrap for this vlog. I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly think that we've done some good things for charity, so I shall put the link if you would like to donate. That would be very hospice, would really gratefully receive those donations. And what is to come next vlog is a definite hardcore week of exercise where I'm going to be looking at managing circuit sessions, yoga sessions, runs, weights, etc. And develop a little bit from this vlog to show you what I normally do for other types of activity and how to manage that. I'm going to put a little few video snippets now to give you a preview of what's to come because um, I think there's definitely something more for the boys on this one. Keep pushing. <laughs>